a feminist, but recently I got frustrated and tearful in a public place and a random man asked me why I was crying and I snapped at him. It's the only bodily function women are allowed. <laughs> really, liquid's not allowed to come out anywhere else. I'm like, this is, this is coming out of my eyes. Okay. I do think sometimes it's why I feel more tearful than uh, some of the men in my life is because... Yeah, the, you're We're, not allowed to sweat. You're not allowed to bleed. You're, you just, I mean, I mean, I, I do those things regardless. But yeah, the fe- it, it doesn't. But you're not allowed to talk about it. You have to pretend it's not happening. What I'm and saying. Whack on the powder. Yeah, I feel like women are allowed one bodily function, and it's tears. But then we will be judged for them anyway. Yeah, you go. I'm a feminist, but when I was reading a book and it said picture a CEO, I pictured a man until the book used the pronoun she. <laughs> Well, they, oh, they, uh, you've gotten judgy. <laughs> just, just give us a cheer if you've never, never, never misgendered an animal in a children's book or a person in a book because they've got like a, they're a doctor or something. Not one of you can cheer. Listen, I acknowledge my mistake, but I think you would have done the same thing because it wasn't like a character in a fiction book. It was a self-help book on ADHD written by a man. And when it got to she, I was like, I think I should marry this person. (laughs) And everything in this book is correct. I haven't finished it because I have ADHD. (laughs) This is the thing where they, they always go, oh, do you want this wall planner and do you want this, all this ADHD material that I know is just going to end up in a big doom pile? Yeah, no, I bought, I bought me and my partner ADHD uh, fancy book planners that were like all magical looking. And uh, I had it for six months and then I finally threw mine away. I had it on the weekend. Tom was clearing stuff out because we were doing a big, another one, of, another in a series of our clear outs. Does, does everyone else get clutter? Always battling clutter. I, clutter is like a physical manifestation of the patriarchy as far as I'm concerned it's like one of those things and Tom held up this like ADHD planner and I went Tom I never even knew I had it he went I gave it to you for Christmas yeah. he put it he put it in my Christmas stocking which I'm going to say is highly unromantic it's basically organize yourself um, he did romantic presents as well it was, it's a stocking I'm a feminist, but I have a really good new personal trainer via Zoom because I want to get strong and I want to get fit, right? And he's really, really good and I'm making progress. But he called me love and darling and sweetheart and I decided not to correct him because he's from Yorkshire. (laughs) It's like, it's a Yorkshire, it's a northern darling. It's a northern love. I can sense it. I can feel it. And actually a very feminist friend of mine hooked me up with him because I, okay, I don't even know if I should say this. I'm going to say, gonna say I'm going to save it for the next one. I'm going to okay. save the next one. All right. Yeah, if you hated the CEO thing, you'll really judge me for this. <laughs> I'm preparing myself, not you. I'm a feminist, but I watched a Woody Allen film last week. <gasps> I knew it! I knew it! You pretend you make a safe place, Deborah. You bring me here for them to judge! What, which It was Annie Hall. Uh, I think Annie... I'm a feminist, but I think Annie Hall, I, it's hard never to watch that. Like, I, I don't, I, I would not normally watch anything by Woody yeah. Allen anymore. However, it's hard to th- imagine I'll never watch Annie Hall again because it, I, I just don't want to erase Diane Keaton's performance. It's, it's uh, about Annie Hall. It's not really about him. It's the first film I ever saw where it's a love story and they don't end up together at the end. Spoilers. Spoiler alert. <laughs> but none of you are going to watch it, are you? <laughs> Due to the judging. And, uh, and I, I just, I really liked that. It's, about there's that. some amazing things in Annie yeah. Hall. But I do, do you know what I won't watch? This, this is my line, mm-hmm. is... Art from Woody Allen that I think is making his case for him. There's one that's, is it Manhattan or something, where some unaccountably oh, yeah. beautiful 18-year-old continues to throw herself at him and things like that. And I'm like, no. Yeah. But I don't think Annie Hall's trying to make Woody Allen's view of the world popular. No. This is, a, I mean, we're in very dodgy territory here, and I'm aware of that. But that's why it's in the I'm a Feminist Butt yeah. section. Not I was just going to say it and not discussion. defend myself, but thank you for defending me. Are you all still judging or both of us now? <laughs> Who's judging? Just give us a share. It's all right to judge. Who's judging? I am. Okay. Fair. Thank you. Thank you. Who's, who's like, I sort of see what you mean. Yeah. Who doesn't care? Who's like, 
who's like the world's on fucking fire who cares if Abigail Shimon watches Annie all in her spare time what about the rainforest I'm a feminist but it started to annoy me that my personal trainer was saying love and darling and I hadn't corrected him and in the moment while I was lifting weights I thought there must be a way without saying this doesn't feel feminist to me because I thought I don't want to put him on he's just a nice Yorkshire man with a touch of the Alan Partridges <laughs> and I'm like he's not meaning anything but I don't want to make this uncomfortable so instead of just saying hey as a general rule if you're working with women in a professional capacity calling them love and darling might make them feel and I know you don't mean it this way I know you do not mean it this way but might make them feel a bit diminished because of the other relationships in their life and their professional relationships and the history of the world so it's not you I call people darling a lot I'm in show business but I feel like when an older man does it it can feel a bit or any man does it to a woman there's a gendered relationship there so instead of saying that like as a rule in your job maybe just try and give it up don't freak out but just try and give it up that's what I should have done mm -hmm. But in my head, I thought, I don't want to make this awkward. Mm. But I want him to stop. And just in a moment, I thought, I've got it. <laughs> and I said to him, hey, I had another personal trainer who I didn't like. I love working with you. I love work. I think I'm working great progress. And I love the way you're, you know, I love where you're getting me to. It's and he is really, really good. Like, I feel I'm making progress. And he does something with me. And then we do a bunch of exercises. And he tests it again to see that I can... I'm stronger in that way. Some of the things are cruelly painful, but it's really working and I'm loving it. I'm feeling good. Um, so I said to him, I just love working with you, but I had another personal trainer a couple of years ago and he used to call me love and darling. And I, it's reminding me of him. <laughs> so instead, could you call me Deb or Deborah? Because that then won't remind me of him because I really like you. And he saw straight through it <laughs> of course it was so implausible I didn't have time to think about it really I just thought I've got it I did not have it I did not have it Abigail and it was embarrassing and I mean I would have gone the passive aggressive route like I probably wouldn't have been like don't call me lover darling I would just also call him pet names back <laughs> So every time he'd be like, well done, love. I'd be like, thanks, Pookie. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> but I don't want it to be awkward. So instead, I did this really unawkward thing <laughs> of going, there was another guy, okay? I like Reminding that. me of him. But it's probably a good strategy in bed if you have a yeah. new lover to go, you're an amazing lover, but another lover <laughs> used to put his hand there. And it always annoyed me. And you, when you do it, it's amazing. But it's just reminding me of him. And I don't want to be thinking about anyone else in bed. So if you could just not do the thing you're doing, I wouldn't recommend this strategy. It's not going to work anywhere in the world, guys. It's just a bad, bad strategy. I'm a feminist. I don't want to tell you. I'm a feminist, but I prefer male massage therapists over female because I secretly think they're stronger. Oh! For those listening at home, I'm now hiding under the table. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Well, while I support female taxi drivers... <coughs> <coughs> Oh, this is going somewhere very badly. It's only if I'm going to the airport, because then I have to put my own suitcase in. Like, if it's... It, I can't let them do it. They're no stronger than me. Yeah. What I would like is, like, Uber drivers and taxi drivers, if I want more female Uber drivers, you know, any, not Uber, because we don't want Uber really at all, but, you know, we want more female drivers. But I just think men should have to volunteer to put the suitcase in, like, jury duty. So neither of us have to lift the suitcase. See, this is where I feel like I'm... I'm a good feminist or a, maybe more of a passive aggressive feminist. So if I'm carrying a heavy suitcase, like say up the subway stairs, or if I have to load it into someone's car and they go to pick it up, I always go, oh no, no, you shouldn't. It's very heavy and do it myself. Do you? Yeah, I never let anyone touch well, my you, suitcase. You can come with me to the airport. I will. So and I, I will deadlift your suitcase for you. Thank you. Live from King's Place in London, the Spontaneous Shop presents The Guilty Feminist. With me, the Pegasus Wife, guest host, Abigail Ayer-Shawn, and our very special guest, Eva Meadow and Alex Cowan, talking about intimacy coach 
coaching and partner surrogacy. Hello, 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 hello. It's so delightful to see you all. Have you all been being feminists? Excellent. Busy being feminists. Uh, just give us a cheer if you're more feminist than guilty. Give us a cheer if you're more guilty than feminist. We're in for a fun evening. Uh, listen, we need both. We need both just to balance us out because we don't need this show to be one thing or another. Uh, give us a cheer if you're a straight, cisgendered white man. He sounds very happy about it, doesn't he? There's, there's more than one, but some of them sounded a bit apologetic. There were some men that went, yeah, okay, fine. Uh, I see where you're going with this. And there was one man that went, it's awesome! Who was the man that cheered for it's awesome? You did. You did. You were cheered. It was, it was, interestingly, four men put their hands up then. And we all think it's awesome. What's your name? David. David. David, thank you so much for coming. Uh, what's brought you here? You've been to quite a few shows. You're a regular. David, I'm delighted to hear that. Don't applaud men for just coming through the door. This is why the bar is so low for them. You'll go, we all came. Where's our round of applause? Thank you. I, seriously, seriously, all men have to do is say they're a feminist. He's at the event and women are going, I love him, are you married? Um, are you married, David? People are interested. You are married? Are you with your wife? Yeah. Excellent. Which of you buys the tickets? I bought the tickets. You bought the tickets. Uh, yeah, again, people are going, oh, I wish I was married to David. <laughs> Lucky David's wife, they're thinking. And that's what, how you'll be identified here now, David's wife. It's a feminist show, but still. I'm sure you have your own name. Oh, what is it? Suzanne, Suzanne, is da would you describe David as a feminist? <laughs> There's a long pause. There's a long pause there. Okay, I'm going to throw it back to David. David, how would we know you're a feminist if you didn't tell us you were? Like, show me you're a feminist without telling me you're a feminist, like that meme. Uh, I support the rights of many minority groups. H how? Don't start feeling sorry. I can see women going, oh, poor David. He's fine. Hey, David's fine. Look at him. He's solid as a rock. I need to feel sorry for him just because we're having a conversation about feminism. David's fine. David's fine. Did you not hear? He's a white, straight, cisgendered man. He's fine. He's won life's many lotteries. Go sorry, David. Sorry, David. Continue. Marchers reading, listening to podcasts, excellent. The marchers part is for us. The reading and the podcast is for you, just so you know. Um, people aren't laughing as much at that as I thought they were. People are now starting to go, yeah, David. <laughs> He's not doing enough, they're thinking now. They're thinking. Um, David, I'm delighted that you're doing the work, and I hope you continue to come to the show, and uh, thank you very much. You're very welcome. Um, yeah, you are allowed to applaud now. Um, I want to ask you, who thinks they've got a feminist job? Just give us a cheer. And it could be a vol it could be your job job, or it could be a voluntary job. But who thinks they do a feminist job? Just give us a cheer. And who thinks Suzanne? You do, David Suzanne. Again, you're not David Suzanne. That's not how you identify. <laughs> It's a feminist show. It's a feminist show. What do you do, Suzanne? I support women uh, breastfeeding babies. You support women breastfeeding babies. <laughs> Excellent. Do you see the difference in how David got his applause and how <laughs> Suzanne had to get hers? She had to work. She had to work in lactation <laughs> to get in the lactation industry to get hers. You cheered him as soon as he walked through the fucking door. <laughs> Can you not see the vast gap, even in how we perceive the act of feminism? Most of what David does is listen to podcasts. I suspect what he does is listen to this podcast because there are some good jokes in it. This week, you'll think, oh, he won't want to listen because he'll be embarrassed. No, he'll love listening because he's in it. That's, 
He'll be thrilled. He'll tell all his friends. He'll tell all his friends. You've got to listen because I'm in it and I come across pretty funny. That's what he'll say. That's what he'll say. Suzanne, you're shaking your head, David. You won't tell your friends you're in it. I think you will, David. Go on. Tell your friends. They'll love it. Do you hide your feminism from your friends? Is that what you're saying, David? You don't tell the boys down the pub. I see. I see where this is going. Do you ever talk to other men about feminism, David? What's the pub? What's the pub? A what's a pub? Oh. No one believes you, David. Now, Suzanne, is there anything we can support? Uh, is there anything you'd like us to read, look at, follow, donate to? La Leche Lead. Leche as in the Spanish word for milk, and that's really important because the English word for leche <laughs> is not at all feminist. So it's la leche. League. Oh, la leche league, like the league of the league of gentlemen. I see, except not gentlemen, <laughs> unless they're gentlemen who breastfeed, and that does happen. And uh, if you look up the Lecture League and you can, if you're interested in it, you can find it there. Excellent. Um, anyone else think they've got a feminist job? What? Yes. What's your name? Barbara. Barbara. And what do you do? I'm a volunteer with Florida Freedom to Read Project, fighting book bans in Florida. Wonderful. <laughs> can you tell us a little bit about what's happening in Florida at the moment? Because it sounds scary. Like they're sort of banning drag and banning critical race theory and banning everything, as far as I can make out. It, it's very, very scary. Our teachers are frightened for their jobs. If they so much as mention, they might have a same-gender partner. Our, recently, they just released the African-American standards for the Florida curriculum. And they're supposed to, the teachers are supposed to tell children that slaves benefited from slavery. No! Yes, because they learned trades that would benefit them when they were free. Oh, wow. This is really horrible. Um, is there anything that we... What, first of all, what books are they banning and what's your project and how is it coping with it? So they're banning anything from Toni Morrison, Bluest Eye, and Tango no. Makes Three, um, Simple, uh, Julian is a Mermaid, uh, pretty much any book that might have a slight reference to race or sexuality, uh, Are You There, God? It's Me, Margaret. So lots and lots of classic books. We are, so the, the non-fun kind of flashy part of the job is we submit what are called freedom or public records requests to school districts to find out what books are being challenged so that we can then fight and get people to school board meetings to fight against those, get people in the review committees to stop the bans. We do tables at various events to make sure people are aware of how bad it really is. How successful are you at the moment, Barbara? We got Bluest Eye back in the county I live in. They tried to ban a movie about Ruby Bridges, who, um, for those unfamiliar, she was one of the first children to integrate schools in, um, I think it was Montgomery, and I don't remember the city, but that movie was banned for a short while. We got that back. Um, if anyone had ever heard of a mo woman named Amanda Gorman, she was the youngest ever poet laureate, yes. read a poem at Biden's inauguration. Her poem was banned, her entire book was banned in Miami-Dade County in Miami. That's still in banned, but we were the ones who brought that to light, that the ban is there, so that she was aware of it and that others are aware. So we are, we're making slow and steady progress, but it's always, it's still going to be a long battle. What can we do to support you? So from the UK, spread the word, let people know how bad it is. If you ever want to donate, you can go to Florida Freedom to Read Project, just Google that. Donate money, buy t-shirts. We've got lots of really cool t-shirts, though I don't know if they'll ship to the UK, but donations are always, everything we do costs money and it's 100% volunteer run. Okay, all right, we'll, we'll, we'll try to find a way to support that. Um, I feel like we should do some, when you go back, when are you going back? I leave on Saturday. Okay, so maybe we could do a podcast uh, via Zoom or something with you and try and raise some money because it's really, really scary. Do you understand, and maybe this is a subject for the podcast, but do you understand the drag ban? Like, how can you define what drag is? It, because women wearing trousers used to be drag. There are men who wear, like, guy liner and have long hair, but they look 
masculine, like glam rock, what is it exactly that they're banning? I think you have to be defining what you're banning. Or is it like you can't do drag and serve alcohol or something like that? Like what's the ban? So the ban itself is not, did never state specifically drag where drag comes into play. And there is an injunction. So right now drag is still alive, but in the law, the wording specifically bans um, under 18 in an area where there might be, I don't know if it doesn't say artificial or fake, but basically the various, you might have somebody doing drag, doing wearing artificial breasts or artificial genitalia. So anything where it might be conceived as sexual with that in place is what they're banning. And that clearly targets only those doing drag. Right. Talk okay. I don't know how you either legislate for or I don't know how to police it. I don't know. But I th I've seen, we, we should talk more about this on a longer podcast because we've got guests on tonight. But I want to, I want to hear more about it, Barbara. So could you, you know, we, are you guys interested in this? Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Uh, Barbara, we really appreciate it. Thank you. We always have such interesting people in our audiences. I always just think, well, if we just locked the doors for 48 hours between us, we could probably solve a good 25% of the world's problems. Um, does anyone here think they have an unfeminist job? Give us a cheer. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Great. What's your unfeminist job? Oh, a stay-at-home mum. A stay-at-home mum? That's not unfeminist. <laughs> No, that's not unfeminist. That is not unfeminist at all. You're raising the next generation of feminists. And can I ask who you're raising? Um, a boy and a girl. Boy and a girl. Yeah, maybe three, maybe five months. Three and five months. Well, listen, there'd be nothing for Suzanne to do in her feminist <laughs> Leche breastfeeding operation if you were not breastfeeding at some point you know are you breastfeeding at five months yeah, it would tonight. have it not tonight <laughs> excellent um not tonight as you raise a pint excellent <laughs> suzanne any advice on that you just pump it out it can be more challenging than that what's your name emily, emily doesn't want to hear about it okay <laughs> she just wants to drink she wants to pump and dump uh, I'm just... <laughs> what was that we've lost the art of breastfeeding yeah. There's been a disruption in the culture. Okay, maybe we need to talk more about that as well. <laughs> Absolutely. I'm all for a woman's right to choose and have the odd cheeky pint, though, on a night out, because I think mental health is important when breastfeeding too. Would you agree, Suzanne? Absolutely. Suzanne agrees and endorses. <laughs> could, we, could we get a shot of tequila in here? Uh, for anybody who's breastfeeding, just for tonight. Uh, who reckons they've got an unfeminist job? Yes? What's yours? Wedding dress designer. I'm I've never had a lesbian couple. They've all been women married men, so I wouldn't say that quite. They've all been women marrying men. You would prefer some lesbian, uh, genderqueer, queer people. You would love that, but they've not come yet. So, okay, can I say the brand name because you're trying to attract a more intersectional clientele? What is the brand name? Chantel Mallet, and you design. So, if I came to you, you could, would you design me a wedding dress? Yeah. Excellent. I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not getting married, but I, I don't really care. I'm a feminist, but I now want you to design me a wedding dress. Could we not have some kind of ironic party? I don't know. Can you do me a ball gown, or is it only wedding dresses? You go out in ball gowns once a month. Okay. Oh, did you go to Barbie in a chink? Well, chill. Listen, listen, listen. I haven't been to Barbenheimer yet, so I'm, I, I may commission a frock yet. Um, I'm a feminist, but, uh, and I don't think that's an unfeminist job. Why are women not allowed to look? It's not a feminist job. We rule it. Not a feminist job. Not a feminist job. We are yet to find one unfeminist job. Please, someone help us out. Yes, what's your unfeminist job? I sell financial products to middle-aged white men. We have a winner! <laughs> What's your name? Emily. Emily! Yeah. Oh, do you also take people's garden gnomes and send them around the world? <laughs> Emily, do you try and direct them to more sustainable he uh, products? Sometimes. Sometimes. Why don't you do it all the time, Emily? <laughs> Some of them don't want to hear about it, but do you try and push that on them? Yes. Do you sometimes say to them, this is going to have a better investment than this one, and you secretly know that it's better for the world or the environment, but they don't know that? 
Yes, that is what she does. So what she's doing is stealth feminism in an unfeminist job. Emily is a Trojan horse of a woman. Turns out we have no unfeminist jobs in the house. So are we ready to start the show? Then welcome, welcome, welcome my incredible co-pilot for this evening is the wonderful Abigail and Shimon. Darling, come take a seat. This is The Guilty Feminist, the podcast in which we explore our noble goals as 21st century feminists and the hypocrisies and insecurities which undermine them. I'm Deborah Francis White. With me is Abigail Shimon, And tonight we are talking about, this is very exciting, intimacy coaching and partner surrogacy. So our guests work with uh, disabled people facilitating and enabling sexual exploration. Whether or not you're disabled, you're going to get lots out of it. Um, yeah. And as feminists, we all need to know about it. Because we're going to be talking about fucking. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's right, Abigail. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I had to do the feminist version. Otherwise, why am I here? That's... <laughs> Abigail is tonight playing the part of guilty. <laughs> I'm playing the part of feminism. Just, it depends on who comes out, what the dynamic is. Sometimes yeah. I have to play the part of guilty and my co-pilot plays the part of feminism. But that's not the case ever with Abigail. No. Now, <laughs> Abigail, did you hear our audience member Robert talking about the Florida ban? Yes, yes, I did. And uh, I really appreciated it because it was uh, clarifying a lot of questions as an American who no longer lives in the UK and also highlighted more questions because as you said, like, how are they banning it and they haven't figured it out? But I do know, and where is Barbara in the audience? There you are. Hi, Barbs. Hey, Babs. Uh, I have heard this. I don't know if you have heard this, uh, Barbara, being a uh, Florida resident, that Florida is now on a, like, how how do they classify them as like an unsafe place to travel? Yes. Like like you know. Explain it though. Well, they're like if you go to websites and stuff. Yes, is it is it red zoned? It's a- oh, hold on, hold on, microphone, microphone for Barbara. So basically, I feel like Barbara it, maybe should keep there. The there are like travel safety levels, and it's like. Ukraine right now, very bad. Don't go vacationing in Ukraine for obvious reasons. In certain countries, due to their political volatility, sometimes it's suggested that you, maybe you shouldn't be a tourist there. And right now, Florida's on the list. Uh, there was a travel advisory issued by both the, um, I think it was the NAACP, but it's basically for anyone African-American as well as anyone on the LGBTQIA um, group to that Florida may be an unsafe place for them to travel. Yeah. Bloody hell. Yeah. Which is ridiculous because Florida was only made wonderful by the gays. Uh, I don't know if you've, any of you ever saw the seminal film from the 90s, Birdcage, but uh, Miami exists because of the gays. Um, can, is that true? That's amazing. Uh, Barbara, can I ask, um, why do you live there? Is it just where you were born? <laughs> the, I'm a Jersey girl. Um, you but- a Jersey girl. Are you Jersey? No, I, I'm from Ohio and then lived in New York. That, sorry. So yeah. I apologize. I'm, but I've looked at Jersey. <laughs> Who hasn't? From the other side. I'm still there because I haven't found anyone to pay the cost of the custody battle to bring my son out of Florida away from my uh, ex-husband. <gasps> oh, Jesus. So you're kind of stuck in Florida. Another, another 10 years. Another 10 years. Okay. Is it the Father's Rights Acts and all that sort of stuff? Um, this, sorry, this is probably it, too personal. No, it's okay. It's, yeah, I just well, realized. I was like, this isn't any when of I my asked business. That, I was more being like, Rai, like, why do you live there? And I thought you were going to say, because, you know, I could do more activism there and my family live there and blah, blah, blah. I didn't know we were going to, like, be prying into the details of your divorce. And I apologize oh. so furiously. I'm like, but, take it back. I take it back. But no, unless you want to talk about it, Barbara, in which case we're here for you. So I'm, I'm, I am very vocal about why I got divorced. I have a 16-year restraining order. But despite that, my ex-husband still has... Uh, has like every other weekend and every Wednesday with my son. He also has a family with money who will fight to keep me there, um, or at least to stop me from leaving with my son. So once he's 18, but we're, we, he's here in the UK visiting my nieces with my sister who's next to me. So we're trying to introduce him to all the other parts of the world so he can leave when he goes to college. 
Oh, thank you. And, and if you're listening from Florida, we need feminists in Florida. Like I'm being Rai, I'm a comedian, I have to do bits, you know, but we need feminists in Florida. If all the feminists leave Florida, it's not going to be great for Florida. So like, I'm not saying it's your obligation to live in Florida. I'm just saying if you do live in Florida, we support you, we love you. And uh, we're going to try and support uh, the organization that Barbara's telling us about. We don't hate Florida. We just hate what's happening to Florida. And we, uh, we want to fight with you. Thank you. I'll get it. Our first guest today is an award-winning intimacy coach and partner surrogate working with adults with disabilities, facilitating and enabling sexual exploration and expression, sexual sovereignty and autonomy. Please welcome to the stage, Beaver Meadow! <laughs> Our next guest today... <laughs> if... Okay. We're not going to explain it. I, I feel I have to. If you're listening at home and you can't, you don't have a visual, Beaver Meadow has just put down a trophy she won. It's, it's a gold erect penis with wings. Our hand carved. Hand carved. Our second... From Bali. From Bali. Oh, wow. An Indonesian erect penis with wings. Who knew? Pure gold. Our next guest gives talks and workshops on sex and disability, intimacy, and body image. She has also modeled naked and jumped out of an airplane to break barriers around disability. Put your hands together and make incredible woohoo noises for Alex Cohen. Oh, I love it. Uh, hello, Alex. Do you have any phallic images you'd like to put on the table before we begin? It's just that Beaver Meadow came out. And well, put... I have my um, joystick, which people seem to kind of gravitate towards, but actually I can't detach it from my wheelchair. You've got a joystick on your wheelchair. Do people really touch it without your permission? They absolutely do. And what is weird is actually sometimes they do realise and sometimes they really don't kind of absent-mindedly with a kind of looking at my face and then I see their hands kind of caressing my joystick and then I have to madly get out my uh, sanitizing gel and you know, oh. put it all over there. Oh, yes. That's a passag move, isn't it? That's a British way of doing it. Excuse me, could you move your hand so I can sanitize <laughs> my joystick that you've been fondling without my permission? I would just never do it because I just think that's that person's wheelchair. That's really important. Well, yeah, and it, it will move me if, if I... Yeah. I mean, that's if probably more... Earth will move yeah. if so they you, do if that. If they start fondling it, you could just suddenly start going backwards. Yeah, but not in a very enjoyable way for me. No, in that case, it's a sad stick. Well, that... Yeah. Very true. So um, I'm fascinated by what you both do. Um, Beaver Meadow, um, we met... Yes, you've got some fans in. Now, we met you because we, I was starting to talk to you in the audience, and then we said, you've got to come and guest on the show. That's also happened this evening. <laughs> we don't recruit guests exclusively from people I talk to in the show, to be honest, but it just sometimes happens that you meet someone and you think, oh, we've got to talk to you. And you came out onto the stage to volunteer for something, and we ended up talking to you, and we went, oh, my God, this is absolutely fascinating. Can you tell us a little bit about what you do and why... Not to be rude, but can you explain why you've brought a penis? Um, so you asked the audience if they were doing any acts of feminism, and I said that I was up for an award, but the trophy was Golden Flying Penis, and I felt a little bit uncomfortable about um, this as a symbol for sexual freedom because it's a little bit willy-waving, isn't it? It's a little bit um, old hat. Um, and um, I was up for the category of somatic sexologist of the year. And at the time, I was just nominated and I didn't know what I'd, if I, but yeah, I won it. So here I am. With it. Um, and I must admit that when I went, it, it, it's bigger than I 
thought, actually. I think I said when I collected it that um, I know I'm a bit of a size queen, but even I'm intimidated by, by this. Right. Um, and I'm a disability sex coach and, I, and a partner surrogate. And I help people with disability explore and express their sexuality. And everyone wants to know, do you have sex with your clients? And the answer is, um, sometimes it might be needed. Can you explain this to us as if we don't know anything at all about it? How did this begin? What's the function of what you do and, and what's the outcome of it? Um, so typically um, people, or ad- I work with adults and typically they um, are infantilized, medicalized and desexualized. And so I help them explore their sexuality using conscious sexuality frameworks and the wheel of consent. I work with people with uh, visible physical disability. It could be spinal cord injury, spina bifida, cerebral palsy. I also work with people with, um, uh, what did I, did I say hidden? Did I say hidden and then I said physical? What did I just say? Uh, you said then a pause moment. We definitely got Rain physical, fog. but... Go, so, do you also work with people with hidden disabilities? I, I do, I do. I work um, a lot with people with autism, and I use the Wheel of Consent. It's a framework which um, really helps people that struggle with social cues, it helps them to access intimacy, often for the first time. Oh, wow, that's, awesome. that's amazing. Um, a friend of mine was telling me her, when her son, he's autistic, and when he had sex for the first time, was with an autistic partner, and he was living at his mum's house and he kept coming to knock on the door and going, Mum, this is, this is happening. Is this, is this normal? Is, is this? And he was just asking really gynecological questions. And it was really interesting to hear that because, you know, that's the relationship he has with her. And she was like, I was like, yes, it's fine, go away. Uh, but, um, but yeah, he wanted to know, like, is, do I, you know, do I put this into that? Do I do this and this and this? And he wanted to have sex. His partner wanted to have sex. But he had, you know, he had questions. And there is a sort of, in some ways, it would be good if we all felt able to ask those questions. Mm -hmm. And the social cues, I think, sometimes bind us into a place where young people are having sex that they don't want to have, that makes them feel very uncomfortable. They're not sure what their body's doing and who can I ask because it would be embarrassing to ask. And I think it would be so much better if we all alleviated ourselves from those embarrassments and asked those questions more gynecologically or, or what's the equivalent? Phallically? I don't know. What's the... Or, or biologically. Anatomically. Oh, biolo- Anatomically. Anatomically. Thank you. Yes. Thank you so Why much. Why are the two comedians trying to figure it out when we have a sex <laughs> I know. therapist? And we're like, we've got this. We've got this. And then we should just throw to Beaver Meadow. Anatomically. Yeah. Anatomically. Yeah. Um, I might be doing a piece around um, anatomy and education. Mm-hmm. Uh, it might be a piece around um, building intimacy and moving away from performative sex and goal-orientated sex and moving towards um, authentic, intimate connection. Um, and it could be a piece around um, erectile dysfunction. Mm. Um, you know, it's vast. The sexual landscape is vast. There's lots of things to explore. Let's ask Alex now. You do talks on sex, disability, intimacy, and body image. What's the thrust, all puns intended, <laughs> uh, of, as I started that sentence, I went, it's no point saying, I, I, I didn't mean it, but I, now, I do now. Um, what's the thrust of what you talk about? Well, a lot of what I talk about is normalising what people might be feeling, but about that there are no wrong and right questions. It's really important to ask the questions that you want to ask. And also, you know, one size doesn't fit all. Sorry, I realise that that... That's also not very... I've already said thrust, know, it's fine. Good. Let's just assume we're going to talk in a lot of innuendos tonight and lean into it. And that's okay. And also for people to try things. And if it doesn't work first time, it might be that you need to try it a different way. Or it might be that actually it's not right for you. So just leave that alone and um, look at something different that maybe appeals to you. But I think... For disabled people, it's really difficult because you really aren't considered as being sexual beings 
or desirable sexual partners at all. And so sometimes it's really hard for disabled people to have the opportunities to have the same sort of experiences that non-disabled people can just take for granted. You know, even getting into, say, a bar where you might maybe want to, you know, casually meet someone or, or even having an accessible hotel room that you want to use is so hard. Don't so, get me started on that. Mm. So in London, there are four hot- only four hotels that are what I would call accessible with a ceiling hoist, so I can hoist clients in and out of wheelchairs and onto beds. And that's not acceptable. This is London. This is a capital city. And when hotels say accessible, what they mean is they've got a handrail by the toilet. And if you're lucky, there is a double bed, but usually twin beds. And um, there's only three hotels that have ceiling hoists. I mean, I went to a hotel. I booked a double room for me and my husband. And I got there. There were twin beds. That's fine. Not every disabled person comes with a partner. But they were bolted to the wall. And when I said to the manager, oh, gosh, you've just had your hotel newly refurbished. And all your twin beds are all bolted to the wall. And they said, oh, no, all our other twin beds can all be pushed together and zipped together and made into a double bed. But only the beds in the wheelchair accessible room couldn't be done. So somebody had to design that. They had to design beds that were bolted to the wall so that basically, even if you wanted to have sex, you couldn't have sex, let alone would they even dream that disabled people wanted to have sex. And those are the sorts of barriers we face. So having somebody like B, who works to give people experiences, to build confidence, to build knowledge in their bodies, because if you have never had a sexual experience, you don't necessarily know how your body will work. And with the extra layer of disability, that can be another kind of tension. You know, it's tense enough for all of us having your first sexual experiences, let alone then with the layers of disability on top of that. So some of the work that I try and do is to dispel some of those kind of myths and stereotypes and prejudices around sexual experiences for disabled people, with also talking about that there are real difficulties as well you know it's not just all it's difficult in the kind of world and society in which we live the built environment and everything it's difficult it has its challenges as well as being you know fantastic and very enjoyable so can I ask Beaver when you're working with a client how much of it is about patriarchal structures and pressures that come in because we've all been trained to think what a sexualized person looks like and what a fanciable person looks like and accessibility in buildings and that kind of thing and how much of how much of that is the problem I guess I'm asking Um, so I mean it's massive I think that my, my role in particular I see myself as a problem solver so um if there's a barrier in the way to um to exploring your sexuality I'm going to figure out a way to overcome that and is it do we need to bring in a piece of equipment do we need to um, find a a different venue do you need to help um, accessing or being integrated into a sex party for example do you need support going to a sex shop oh there's no ramp oh sorry we can't we can't go there that actually happened Mm. Um, and in terms of the uh, The patriarchy, I think the biggest problem that I face with all clients, regardless of their disability, is the idea that sex is um, goal-orientated and there's a performance element. And um, with disability, that has to go right out of the window because I might be working with someone who um, can't touch themselves, who might not have sensation, who might not have function anymore. I recently worked with a client who... Um, was recovering from prostate surgery and he now needed to use a penis pump um, and I saw that and on just like that the new sex in the city I saw a penis pump oh you did yeah it was in last week's episode I think um, 
uh, I, this, is, this is an absolutely useless interjection, actually, I now realise. <laughs> it was more that I was like, that's just been on a show that lots of people, although, I mean, we're not sure why we're watching it, we'll, we'll be honest. Uh, but it's uh, because it's a continuation of this. And I thought, oh, this is really interesting because Seema, the character who had a partner who was pumping, said... Uh, uh, she was like, I'm fine. Abs- she was absolutely fine with it. She was just like, it was. It was quite, was quite a good representation, I think. Whereas he said, look, some people are weirded out by this, but this is what I need to do. And she was like, yeah, and it's absolutely fine. But then he was cross that she used a vibrator, and then she went, well, no, then we're we're, we're done. And uh, I liked the fact that the representation was, if this is what I need to do, this is what I need to do. Which is okay if you have a supportive partner, but if you're just whipping out a penis pump on a first date or a hookup, it can be quite a shock. And also, if you're not fully comfortable with how it works yourself, then that might need to be explored in a more safe container with somebody who can um, explore that with you um, without pressure to perform. This is the point where I... Abigail, 37 years old, realizes that I only know the concept of a penis pump as a punchline, and I don't actually understand their function. Mm. Like, I know they help. The, do they bring blood to the penis? That's, that's what they do, right? Oh, I did know. Yeah, they, yeah. It's like a, a suction thing. It, it fills the penis with blood, and then you put a cock ring on, which acts as, it keeps the blood in it, keeps the erection there. Oh. So it makes penetration possible. Oh. Yeah. And it's great because there's so many products on the market now. And I love how sexuality is being reframed as health and wellness and growth and development. And it's moving away from kind of adult entertainment and objectification um, and gratification. And isn't it incredible that we're living in a world where sexuality is getting an upgrade, isn't it? Like along with everything else. And people are becoming more, it's like more mindful, more aware, more conscious. And these consent dialogues that we're having and really owning your own pleasure and knowing what you want and being able to say yes, like a, a um, you know, a, a hell yes or a fuck no. Was it a fuck yes or a hell no? I don't know. That but kind of thing, is it? Just as you were talking about working with your clients of moving away from goal-oriented sex to sex with pleasure, like, because I grew up in the 90s, like, that's such a radical idea because when I was learning about sex, it was all about, like, the end game, which, uh, as, as far as I remember from all of the 90s rom-coms I watched and uh, teen movies, had nothing to do with female pleasure, but had everything to do with, like, uh, at the end. Yeah. I think we all know what I'm talking about. I, I actually grew up in the Mormon church. Oh. 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 <laughs> yeah. yeah, I was a Jehovah's Witness, so yay, sister. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Beware of bringing your children up too religiously because this is what happens. Yeah. <laughs> they end up sitting on a stage yeah. talking about penis pumps. Alex? Yeah. Mormon, proudly. Mormon proudly. church? Were you uh, raised in uh, a religious church? No. <laughs> sorry. No, don't be sorry. Be thrilled. Um, uh, how much of it is unpacking those issues? Because I think we could all do with less uh, orgasm-oriented sexual education. Um, someone I know recently went to a tantric uh, workshop and they said, just let the whole thing about orgasms go and just it's just in the now, it's just in the now. We're so obsessed with the orgasm. And I thought that was really, really interesting because a lot of the sex I enjoy, actually sometimes the orgasm can be a bit much. It's the bit just before the orgasm that can be the most sexual, if I can be so bold to just, just discuss my own pleasure. Um, <laughs> it, <laughs> I've said it boldly. I thought, just say it boldly. You're a feminist. And then I've immediately gone, oh, I'll be, they're all looking at me. They've paid to look at me. That is what an audience is. I don't know what I, where I expect you to look. Um, but do you know what I mean by that? Does anyone else know what I mean by that? It's yeah. The bit before the orgasm yeah. is the... Or it just seems unnecessary. You're having a good time. You're talking about edging, about your edge when you get to the edge. About the edge. The edge. The, oh, that makes it sound so yeah, well, freaking edge. cool. <laughs> Like, yeah, like put on my leather jacket and let's, let's do some edging. <laughs> but I think that is one of the kind of plus sides of when I talk about disability and sex and sexuality. It is about discovering and learning new things because it is about reframing sex. Because sometimes 
either your sexual functions don't work in the same way that they used to. And I hate the term sexual dysfunction because actually it's just about functioning differently, you know, and it's not better or worse. It's about, you know, discovering the different things that now can give you pleasure and not getting hung up on what society says you sh it, a good sex life looks like. You know, sometimes when people describe, you know, sort of what sex should be like, or sometimes that it makes me just feel exhausted. <laughs> and, you know, I kind of think, oh God, do I have to work that hard? Yeah. My brain just can't take it all. Um, <laughs> so yeah, you know, just go with it and learn new things discover new things and don't be scared of experimenting, trying different things and also being sad about some of the things that you can no longer maybe do as a disabled person. But really try and look for the things that you can and do enjoy. And there are loads. <laughs> <laughs> um, what is it that we can do to be a feminist allies to the disabled community where it comes to sex is it is it awareness is it what what's what's useful beaver is it staying is it minding our own business i don't know um be open to dating someone with a disability i would say is probably a biggie do you think it's common for people to rule out partners with disabilities yeah absolutely because we're so conditioned aren't we to perceive desirability or you know beauty or sexuality in a certain way and if you fall outside of that you're kind of you know out of the sexual marketplace and um that's that's really not okay we have to broaden um our concept of what um, attraction is or what sexuality is or what brings two people together in connection and then if you know we're conditioned aren't we to like be first um, attracted sexually and, and, and chemically and then kind of decide if you're going to have a relationship afterwards but actually taking the time to get to know somebody first perhaps might might be a good way and um the the, so so there's a thing in the disabled community is like don't put me on a pedestal don't um uh, what's the word? You know, when you kind of um, make someone inspirational. Yeah, don't call. Yeah, don't call us inspiration. We're just normal, regular people. We want to have the same opportunities as everyone else. Don't overprotect us. Don't um, over safeguard us. Yes, if there's a question around capacity, and uh, and then safeguarding is needed. But no, disabled people. Um, you know, just, just the same as everybody else. It's just that their bodies might be different, or might work differently, or the brains might work slightly differently. But they. Um, Actually, in my experience working with this client group is that they have a unique perspective on the world because they've had to go through so much more. And those connections are, in my experience, deeper and richer than just your casual hookup. And I'm not knocking casual hookups. Pleasure in and of itself is fantastic. Um, but don't rule out somebody with a disability as a potential partner. Um, Alex? Uh, I just wanted to direct the same question to you. What can we do as allies to support disabled people? I think I absolutely agree with all the things that B has said. I think also non-disabled people need to examine their own prejudices about disability, about sex as well and what sex means to them and how they really feel as sexual people. Because sometimes it's the lack of confidence and the feelings of inadequacy that people can have within themselves, which means they close off to other people because they don't think they could cope with it or they, they worry about what their friends might say. Um, and so, you know, I really think you need to be open to examine things and to just go for it. And I think, you know, having good role models who are having sex with disabled people, but also disabled people who are having sex um, and relationships with all sorts of people does really help. And I think the media has a role to play in that because I think it's awful in the whole portrayal of disabled people were either kind of victims 
or a sad or a charity cases or a pity fuck, all of that. I've had people in my presence say, say to their friends, unbelievably, you mean she's married? Like, who would marry her? Well, I, I, I want to say, when I'm giving a blowjob to my husband, then you ask him why he <laughs> married me. But, you know, I, I don't say that. Yeah. And also get behind Disability Pride Month, yeah. which is every July um, since 1990. Who knew? And it's to um, celebrate the enactment of the Disability Act. Um, and there was a storming of Capitol, Capitol Building, and there were a thousand protesters. A good, a good storming. Not yeah, the, but it actually was Not the most recent one. I was going to say. It wasn't actually a storming, it was a cruel, because 60 of them crawled up the steps, yeah. And not many people know about this. Because they, 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 there's a... It, it, I, so, this is going to come out later, but right now, for the audience... It's uh, July 24th, so we have a few more days of uh, disability pride. Uh, camp Crip, is that what it's called on Netflix? Talks about this camp where a bunch of uh, disabled people got to go when they were younger, and uh, they started to explore their sexuality. It's very, it's very cool because they were all young and disabled and horny, and then like STDs broke out at summer camp. It's all very, very cool. And they, they, and then they grew up to be these activists. That I'm spoiling the documentary, but if you want to support disability pride this month. One thing you could do is go see that. Or I'm going to go have sex with my autistic boyfriend. That's what I'm going to do. <laughs> um, I need this wheel of consent. I want to talk to you uh, about that. I'm not joking there. There was a brilliant play by Francesca Martinez, which I'm not sure if it's yet released, you know, National Theatre Live, called All of Us. And there was a really interesting depiction in that about the fetishization of sometimes uh, women in wheelchairs, and I'm sure men as well, but that's what it was depicting as well as the sort of the othering, the the dehumanising, and it it wasn't about that. It was about it was chiefly about this government's attitude towards disabled people and the continued defunding. Um, it's a brilliant play, absolutely brilliant. So I do hope it's if it's if it's on not on National Theatre Live yet, it will be. Um, and these these are things that it I think it does behove non disabled people to examine and look at, unpack our own prejudice. And unpack, you know, be just be aware of the comments that are being made. Uh, and uh, I went on a writers' retreat once for the BBC, where they were particularly encouraging writers that they already use to think about disabled characters in the same way. Now we wouldn't have a show with all white people or all uh, straight people. We wouldn't do Friends anymore, just because it's not very interesting to have a homogenised group in that same way. Um, and we looked at the way that disability is often depicted on screen and the for comedy and the vast majority for comedy was people faking it it was fascinating we were just like what like every scene is people faking it people faking it people faking it like not faking orgasms just to be clear faking disability um so i think we do need to ask our broadcasters to provide better content as well um we've got to uh, finish up for the interval but is there anything you came to say that you didn't get to say beaver meadow um well, I'm just a little bit worried that after doing this, after this podcast comes out, that I'm going to be inundated with work. And so I just want to let everyone know that I'm taking a month off because I really need some time off to get the book finished. I'm writing a book. You're writing a book. Work. What's your book called? Oh, working title, um, a Therapeutic Whore, Contemporary Sexuality. Excellent. Okay, well, we look forward to that. And is there anywhere else we can follow you? Uh, TikTok. Follow me on TikTok, the Disability Sex Coach, and on Instagram, Disability Sex Coach. Disability Sex Coach, that's yes. your handle. Yeah. Excellent. Um, thank you so much. And uh, can I ask you, Alex, uh, is there anything you came to say you didn't get to say? Um, sometimes talking isn't enough. And I wish that the people that construct sex therapy courses and sexual health courses and things like that would actually realize that a bit more and not be so closed to it sorry that's very controversial and I'll probably get a lot of criticism for that but that's something I feel quite strongly about and I'm rubbish at social media I have no hardly any profile I have one picture on Instagram that's it 
But I, I did pose for um, a lingerie company called The Under Argument, and that can be found somewhere on the web. Um, but Who else have you Google. posed naked for? Oh, yes. Did you not pose naked for a very fancy photographer? I did. And a really reputable magazine? Yeah, Good Housekeeping. <laughs> it was. And when I saw the photograph of me, it was really quite revealing. And I, I couldn't help it, but I said, this isn't very good housekeeping like. <laughs> but it was great. Great experience and great exposure to... So to speak. Race of, yeah. yeah. God, honestly, it's really difficult not to do it. Yeah. But I really wanted to show people, disabled people, and I have a catheter... So I had that in the picture because there's such a stigma around that. And I wanted to show that you can still be a sexy being and be disabled and have a catheter. So I bloody did it in good... Sorry. Good on you, Alex. And don't worry, you can swear here. We, we broadcast on His Majesty's Internet. Um, <laughs> And there's some swearing there already, I hear. Um, listen, I love everything that you do. Um, if someone wanted to hire you to speak because you do talks, where would they contact you? I'll to give you an email address that you can... Put on the show put notes. Put on the show notes, okay. yeah. So you're going to go and have a drink in a sec and uh, go to the loo if you need to. Um, you might be, you know, frankly, so aroused now from this conversation. <laughs> Let's go explore some edging. There, there are, I don't know, there are loos out there where you're not allowed to do anything I didn't say to. But uh, don't touch anyone's joystick. That's right. Without permission, it's exactly. rude. Exactly. I think I should take that again and say, because I don't think sad stick is right. So I'm going to say, um, can, Tom, can you edit this in? It's not so much, in that case, it's not so much a joystick as an angry stick. Is that better? I think it's funny. I think it's, it's, it's more... Someone in the audience just went, no. Okay. Um... Okay, all right, I'm going to do this. It's not so much a joystick. Sorry, no, I can't take it again now. Shh. I'm going to point to you when you need to laugh, and don't make the laugh too big, it'll be sarcastic. Okay, okay. It's not so much a joystick as a sad stick. Yeah. Or... No, it's not sad, it's a That's, magnet. It's a, but no, but I'm saying, remember when you said if someone else touches it, and you said, and then I said it's not, remember when I did that joke, and you said, oh, yes, it is, right? I then thought people are going to go, I'm not sad if someone touches my wheelchair. I'm angry. So I thought, but so I thought sadness was the opposite of joy. So that you can see mad where my mind was going. Mm. So a mad stick, but mad sometimes means insane. Yeah. It's tricky. Okay. I'm going to try it again. It's not so much a joystick. <laughs> Alex is not laughing. You know what? I don't think this is worth it. I, no, it really is. I promise you it is. It's not so much a joystick as a sad stick. Or an angry stick. <laughs> if Tom can make anything out of that. Okay, great. Tom's got a better one. Okay. Okay, I'm going to take it here. It's not so much, a, well, in that case, if they're touching it without your permission, you're moving around without your, without, without your permission. It's, I'll have to take it again now. It's... <laughs> Well, in that case, if they're touching it without your permission, it's not so much a joystick as an annoy stick. Yeah, you got that. Good. Yeah. I'm a feminist, but a man just came and gave me that pun. <laughs> a man just came and gave me that pun. He'll probably make that into an outtake now so that he gets the credit. All right. Uh, could you please give a big round of applause for Alex Cohen and Beaver Meadow? <laughs> You have been listening to The Guilty Fabulous with me, Emma Carlson's wife, Gascar's Abigail Shimon, and our very special guests, Alex Cohen and Beaver Meadow. The recording engineer was Charles Thompson. The Guilty Fabulous theme tune was composed by Mark Hodge. The producer was Thompson, who's given us from there to shop. Mr. Rachel Craft, from Gia Dissio, Zainab Mohammed, and everyone at King's Place, as well as all of you for listening. And for more information about this and other episodes, visit guiltyfabulous.com. to do some stand-up and get our guests on, but first, let's play I'm a Feminist But! <laughs> if you've not seen the show before or been to the show or listened to the show before, this is like feminist confessional. So if you're Catholic, you'll really be into it. 
Just give us a cheer if you're Catholic. Give us a cheer if you ever had to do confessional. Okay, is it like this? Uh, is it I'm a Catholic but is that how you start? <laughs> I really wish it were. I think if somebody should do that. If you are if you're a practicing Catholic or you have the right to go into a confessional booth or you no longer believe, could you please go in for me? Not to waste the priest time exactly. <gasps> could be the hot priest from Fleabag. Oh my god. <laughs> I'm a feminist but. Mm. Okay. I need a moment. The Guilty Feminist is provided exclusively from Acast. Find it wherever you get your podcasts.